Before we get into this video, fellas, can I just say a huge thanks to Hampson Auctions. If you've got like a curl car, an oil car, an interesting car, drop Hampson Auctions a message. I'll leave a link below. And if you sell your car with Hampson Auctions, you literally get the full hammer price. They don't take anything off you for selling your car. Like I say, I'll leave the link below. Check it out. This is the last corner for Rob Gravit in the absolutely plain, unsponsored Ford Sierra Cosmo. That's it, over the line. Rob Gravit wins. It's difficult to see how Rob Gravit is going to be able to catch Andy Rouse and get past him now. Down to Lodge, two wins each. Here's the right-hander at Lodge coming up, and Gravit is challenging, and Gravit is through. Rob Gravit goes through. It's going to be a third win for Rob Gravit and the Trackstar team. It is a third win. And Harvey is starting to pull away a bit. No, he's not, because Gravit is closing as they come up to Riches. And my goodness, he's through. Rob Gravit goes through. Looking back, there is Harvey's car. He is counter-attacking. He's, he's up alongside the White Sierra. He's going to retake the lead. No, he's not. He's lost it. Yes, he's lost it. And that is just less grip. So, Rob Gravit leads. Tim Harvey rejoins second. But Rob Gravit wins round eight as he won. Round three, four, five, six, and seven. And now at Brands Hatch, Gravit is once again on pole position as he goes for a seventh consecutive victory to set a new British Championship record. I waited for the moment to unfold. Nobody's gonna make me feel I'm going down. You ready? <laughs> I don't know why I'm going to giggle today. <laughs> All right, fellas, welcome back. I've came to see Paul. You might have seen some videos before. We've been down here a few times now. Paul's got a uh, pretty cool collection down here, haven't you, Paul? <laughs> well, I think so, yeah. <laughs> but we've came to see this car. This is the only car to win the BTCC Championship. What year was this, Paul? 1990. 1990? Yeah. Rob Gravett drove it. The, the, the story with this car is, obviously the Sierra's only really ran in RS500 form for, in 87, 88, 89 and 90. So it was a limited time. Rob Gravett and Mike Smith, the ex-Radio 1 DJ, did a lot of TV work as well. Mike was driving for um, ProDrive for a BMW works team at the time. Right. Um, and Rob was doing a bit of driving for Andy Rouse and what have you. And I think to read in between the lines, they got a little bit sick of team orders. Did they? You know, it was always, you can go as fast as you want, but don't overtake the team <laughs> boss, you know. So Mike and, and, and Rob decided to start their own company which is a company called Trackstar. Trackstar. And the first two cars, which we've featured before, is the one in the background there. That was Rob Gravett's 1989 car, which is DJR1. And Mike Smith had the second Shell Ultra High original car from Dick Johnson, which was DJR2. Rob, early on, drove for Dick Johnson out in Australia. So there was a, you know, a friendship made there. And Rob did a deal with Dick Johnson to buy two cars. DJI 1 and 2. The cars were repainted and rebuilt by Dick Johnson out in Australia before they were shipped over for Rob and Mike. DJI 2 was converted from a left-hand drive car to a right-hand drive car. So when the cars came over, they were all just plain white, uh -huh. but all rebuilt, ready to race. And Rob and Mike were sponsored then by Cartel. And there were their two cars for 89 and 90. Rob did exceptionally well in DJI 1 in that car in 89. Really, really you know, for first first outing really in that car, did exceptionally well. And then in 1990, they decided to build a brand new car. And um, it's always baffled me really, because he did so well in that car, why they bothered to build a brand, this car, a brand mm -hmm. new car from scratch. So anyway, I spoke to Bradley Gravett, which is Rob Gravett's son. I spoke to Bradley yesterday, because I only picked this car up yesterday. And I asked him, because his dad wanted, uh, was out, and he says, Main reason is professional race drivers will tell you that a brand new car 
is always maybe half a second to a second quicker oh, than right. an older car because the older cars are a little bit worn, a little bit tired, a little bit of flex starts to appear in the shells just because of right. you know fatigue uh -huh. being used. And I think also, I, I'm sort of guessing at this, that everybody knew the Trackstar cars were built by Dick Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I think a bit of pride as well will have gone into it and thinking, do you know what, we want to build our own car. We mm -hmm. want to sort of prove to the world that we not only can drive these cars and, them. and run them, we can build them as well. Because mm -hmm. they were a motorsport preparation company with Trackstar that do other things for other people. So I think, you know, the two things combined made them decide to build a brand new car from scratch. So that's what they did with this car. Um, uh, there is a myth. A lot of people get confused because of the association with the Dick Johnson cars for 89. A lot of people think that this was built by Dick Johnson as well. I was going to say, I, had a, I, I did think this was a Dick Johnson built car. Is that Everybody a Google? Does. I th yeah, I think even Google says uh -huh. it is. And, and it wasn't. It, it, the Trackstar built this car themselves. And I think a lot of the confusion is, and that's why I took the cover off that car to show you really, when you look at the two cars, they actually copied the car 100%. When you look at DJR1 and this car, the roll cage is identical, all the switch panels are identical, the suspension is all Eggenberger's suspension, which uh -huh. the, the DJR cars had as well, because Dick Johnson bought all the suspension off Eggenberger. Even the mirrors, the very, very unique mirrors on these cars, because uh -huh. on the Dick Johnson cars, he put the mirrors upside down and tucked them in real close to the bodywork. If you look at all other touring cars, they, they, they come out the other uh -huh. way. But they used to fall down when you were racing. The mirrors used to drop Did down, they? so they were useless. <laughs> so Dick Johnson put them all the way around and fastened them to the body so they didn't move. Even that detail is the same on this car as it is on, on the 89 cars. Yeah, we, they built this car themselves. I recognise it. It does look exactly the same. Even that switch panel, the white one, yeah. made of... Is it, is it steel or aluminium? Aluminium, or? yeah. But exactly I are just... Exactly now you've said it, same. it does just totally... Yeah, like you say, the, the, the gauge pod on the dash is exactly the same. They're obviously different gauges because uh -huh. obviously that car was built in 87 and, and you know, it's only three years, but three years, there's a lot of development uh -huh. on, on, on products and that. I mean, the battery box in the back is absolutely exactly the same fabrication as it is in DJI One. Everything's is the same. The only difference on the roll cage in this car, you look at the back, it's got a double crossover bar, a double bar in uh -huh. the back as DGI 1 and 2 only had a single bar right. at the back. And I think that's just a, a, a standard upgrade, really, uh -huh. that people did. But other than that, it's exactly the same. Even down to the aluminium gear sticks around cowl. You know, that aluminium fabricate oh, on right, there is, right. exactly, is exactly the same. The foot plates are the same. Right. So, yeah. But yeah, built by them for, to, you know, to, to do a purpose, which was to hopefully win in 1990. And they certainly did that. Certainly did. I'll go through it. I actually, I, I printed it off because I'm getting old and my memory's not like it was. <laughs> but the statistics are quite impressive. When you bear in mind that, again, a brand new car for that year for Rob, and usually it sort of takes you quite a few races to get a car right, you know, to, to alter it, adjust it, and, and, and the driver to get used to the car. And I think that's probably why they copied the car perfectly. Rob will have felt he was in Aye. a car he was familiar with. Before we came down, I was looking on YouTube, like interviews with him, with Rob. He says in one interview that these cars were, do I don't know the track, but they were doing 180, 189 mile an hour down a street. And even nowadays, like the modern cars still cannot get, even get near it. I think, again, I've never checked these statistics, but I know statistically the RS500 is the most successful race car ever built. Uh -huh. I've what, always heard that. Yeah, what they're actually comparing is obviously it's the amount of race is that that particular car entered and how many wins it achieved uh -huh. in, in, in every race that nothing's ever beaten the RS500 uh -huh. as a percentage of races won against entered it's something like 80 or is it 90 odd percent but when you look back you know you watch Australian racing European racing British touring cars in 87 88 and 89 when did you ever not see an RS500 right. passed the line first. Do you think that was just because they had so much power compared to most of the, most of the cars? Oh, I mean, in the day, these things, I mean, you, you see them, you see drivers get out of cars after they've driven them, they're absolutely 
knackered, <laughs> knackered worn out. <laughs> they're, they're an absolute animal. They were uh, just, they were particularly a fantastic car. They just had that much sheer grunt and aye. power. You know, you see them coming out a couple of the side. Aye. But then when they got on straight, they were just away. They were just gone. You know, I mean, 550. Would this have been 550? Because yeah, Dick Johnson's were a bit more, weren't they? Th that was later, I think. Was I think, it? I think five to 550 was a realistic sort of figure for the earlier cars. Right. In the latter years, then they started to develop them more and we're getting 600 horsepower plus out of them, which is almost the the down the, the shame really of, of how the system changed and they changed the way the rules were for British touring cars and, and you know changed everything was a two litre class uh -huh. in nineteen ninety one. They said to make it a fair a play you know a fairer playing field for everybody which bollocks in it. <laughs> you know, I mean we all know really nothing could touch a Ford if you had a Ford uh, RS five hundred. No other manufacturer stood an absolute chance in hell of ever beating. These cars were only three, four years in. So really they were still really being developed. I mean uh, the cars like the Dick Johnson cars and the Benson and Edges carried on racing into ninety two and they were getting faster and faster and six hundred plus brake horsepower. They changed the rules were allowing six speed gearboxes in them. Oh, so right. the speeds, some some of the you know quoted speeds of, of Dick Johnson and that down Bathurst Strait, you think <laughs> you can't get a Sierra to go that fast. But people forget, you know, they, they were allowed bigger wheels, six-speed gearboxes. Well, if you could get 160, 170 out of a five-speed box, Aye. and you could then put a six-speed Olinger in it, you're going to get a lot more speed Aye. out of them. So Aye. yeah, they were they were. Unbelievably fast for for the for the late eighties, you know. So do you think this car now is about five five fifty? Uh, yeah, it'll be about somewhere right. around there. Yeah, I mean this um, this car. I'll tell you that the, the brief history of this car, because this car disappeared for years. Did it? And we found it. Me and Ian Goff found this car. A friend of mine that actually owns DJR two. Uh -huh. That restored that for Ian. After 1990, this car was sold because um, <clears> obviously <throat> the rules had changed. Everybody had to move on to this Super Tourer series. It's known as now, or it was then. So this car was surplus. It was no good anymore. You couldn't run this. You couldn't run turbo charges basically right. in, in 1991. Well, you take the turbo off this car, uh, you could probably run round on it and faster. You know, uh, without a turbo, it's a big heavy lump. So the car was no good. And Dave Mountain, who owns Mountain, did back then and still does today, um, was obviously the engine builder for for this team. He built all the engines for Trackstar, and he built a lot of works car engines for rally cars and that all over the world did mount you he bought the car he loved this car dave's very very got a lot of affection for this car because um, again for him you know he was part of it he uh -huh. built the engines that, that won the championship and if you look at a lot of period pictures of this car you see dave mountain in the background somewhere you know went to all the races and supported the car so we had a lot of you know feelings for this car so he bought it and um he didn't have any intentions on selling it he tells me because i spoke to dave yesterday mm -hmm. i sent him a photograph of the car because i know he loves this car and i thought he'll ring me back and he did <laughs> what, what's that you know what's going on and i told him i'd got the car in to be sold he said yeah he said i bought the car at the end of 1990 and i had never intended on selling it and you know, i love the car he said and one of his italian customers came in the workshop who he was building some engines for for a race series out in in italy saw the car parked in corner workshop knew what the car was you know knew it was the gravit 1990 championship winning car and basically i think just said i want it i want it i want you know i have to have Aye. it um and a deal was done and and dave sold it to the to the italian guy and that was it nobody knew where heard it had gone of. or anything and of course the thing with these old cars is as i said to dave yesterday on phone the problem with, with any series of cars whether it be group a the super tour or whatever these cars are expensive cars to build in period and they're uh -huh. very very expensive to run i think these these stories about every round was 35 grand was it to you know to run a car and team you know everything involved tires and everything so a lot of money so when when the series finishes and the rules change and cars change these cars almost become sort of worthless because they're too expensive for a a okay. smaller series you know like your thunder saloons or whatever the cars are too expensive to run uh -huh. 
so the, the, the too high a spec so they tend to just become almost worthless they get stuck in corner of a shed hopefully where they'll be found 25 years later a lot of them get stripped or all the group A parts taken off them and, and they get converted like DJR2 was DJR2 uh -huh. was converted as we know to a rally car yeah to a rally car um, luckily never used but that's what happens to them it's uh -huh. quite common so anyway this car vanished nobody really knew where it was the only person who knew where it was was, was Dave and obviously when I started showing a lot of interest in these cars this was one of the cars that was classed as one of the most important cars there was it was the oh, grand right. championship car where was it nobody knew and of course nobody ever thought to ring Dave Mountain and say where did you sell it you know but anyway as people started looking for this car and searching for it me in particular I was desperate to find this car because of its importance it turned out you know it came out that it was in Italy or that's where it went after Dave had sold it so uh, myself and Ian Goff, who owns DJR2, he uh, has a lot to do with Italy, he has a place in Italy, his daughter at the time lived in Italy, so she had some good connections. And believe it or not, the thing that found the car is still on it. On that metal panel at the back there, the fuel pump covers, can you see the reminder of a sticker? Uh -huh. University Motors. That was the company that ran the car for him. So basically they looked after the car, did the prep work on the car for the guy in Italy that owned it. Ian managed to track that company down and he rang them and luckily the woman who answered the phone speaks perfect English, which most, you know, European companies do, don't they, to be uh -huh. fair, they get taught English. She's perfect English and Ian, do you remember a car uh, that you ran for, oh yeah, he still got it. You're joking. She couldn't tell us where he lived. She wasn't allowed any. Uh -huh. So she told him, him roughly whereabouts in Italy he lived. So Ian rings me straight away all excited. We might have struck lucky here. So he says, get your ass down now. We're jumping on a plane tonight. What year was this? I'm trying to think. It must be six years ago now. Right. Five, six years like ago. Like 2014, 2015? Yeah, somewhere around then. So I drove down to Ian's that night in Northampton. We drove down to airport, jumped on a plane that night, flew over to Italy, got to Italy, hired a car, just a little back of Hi. We had a laugh doing that, to be fair. <laughs> had this town where this guy lived, and we just turned up and asked around locals and what have you, and long story short, he lives on this farm. Very, very wealthy guy. So we find this farm. Ian's like me, you know, not bothered, knocks on the door. Aye. This woman answered and she spoke a bit of broken English. This big farmer fella comes to the door, couldn't speak a word of English. We're trying to explain what <laughs> word are we knocking on his door. Anyway, the long and short of it was he had a friend who, who spoke perfect English. So we rang this guy up. This guy comes over and um, we explains what we want, tells this farmer and it, it takes us to this shed, I call it a shed, it was this, this, one of the biggest buildings you've ever seen, opens these doors where me and Ian just looked at each other, the cars in this really? shed, you've never seen now like it, it was just, it was absolutely immaculate was this, looked like a big old chicken shed but inside was spotless, like, it was spotless and there was just row upon row of race cars. It was unbelievable. Just race cars, just not race, like... You no, know, just all race cars. And this guy, allegedly, you know, a wealthy farmer, and he, and he had a reputation for, as we said earlier, when race teams finish with a car and they move on to a different car or a different series, they want to sell everything as a package. Well, this guy was so well known in Italy for... He would turn up and say, I'll buy all three cars, I'll buy every single spare part, <laughs> and he'll buy the whole lot as a job lot. Well, that's exactly what he'd done. You know, you looked in this shed and every car, they were parked in the herringbone, you know, all like that. Uh -huh. But every car behind it was a rack. Spare. And on that rack was wheels, gearboxes, diffs, engines, all for that car. You know, and he showed us around and he had Zack Speed Mark 1 Escort, Zack Speed Mark 2 Escort. These are worth really? hundreds of thousands of pounds. All famous cars. Aye. And behind every car was... Spares. You know, 20 or 30 wheels, some had two or three hundred wheels, gearboxes, engines, BDA engines, they're, they're worth a fortune. Aye. We looked round this big shed at all these cars, obviously we, we'd seen the Sierra, we knew it was there, then he takes us into this shed further down and he opened the shed and all he had in it was spares, 
racks of engines, brand new BDA engges there must really? have been 30 of them, really? brand new, all wrapped up that he'd managed to get from some race team that were built and never used. It was just honestly mind blowing what this guy had. Oh, really what you just, and then he'd take us into another shed when there was fiberglass moulds for all the, you know, some of the, um, I'm not into these cars, but you know, the, the cars that have all the big fiberglass bodies on. Uh -huh. He'd have 200 spare bodies and then he'd have the moulds to make the bodies with it. So he had everything you Jeez. could, it was just absolutely mind blowing what this guy had. Me and Ian were just like, you know, kids in a sweet shop. Like Disneyland. Unbelievable. Anyway, so we get back to this car and I'll, I'll give you a picture of the car as we saw it. There was two Sierras parked next to each other in like a green, a red and a white livery. Mm -hmm. But I recognised this car straight away because obviously I'd, I'd known the DJR cars quite well. But I'd never seen this car close up and there's very, very few pictures of it actually inside under the bonnet or anything. There's loads of outside uh -huh. pictures. But anyway, I looked inside the car and straight away recognised that the roll cage was absolutely identical to a Dick Johnson car. Everything was exactly the same and I thought, this is it. This is absolutely 100% the Gravit championship winning car. So we were all like giddy and excited, you know. And anyway, I looked around it and I started to look underneath and I noticed all the rear end was Eggenberger suspension. So it had all the right bits on. But then when I looked at the front, everything at the front was wrong. The engine was wrong. It didn't have a 500 engine in it. It had rally car, front 909 suspension on it. And, and I'm like, that's strange. Oh, well, the back's still right, but the front's wrong. Anyway, the other Sierra that was parked next to it, the interpreter was telling us the story that he ran this car for one year, then built this Sierra, which had active suspension on it, which you right. could adjust all the suspension from inside the car. Oh, right. Um, which was, was tried in 89, I believe it was, in the FI, uh, the FINA Sierra RS500 that ran in British touring cars, that had active suspension on it. Well, they developed it further. So what they'd done, they pinched all the best bits off the Gravit car, put them onto this car. Well, of course, I knew what I was looking at, so I quickly identified all the parts on that car for, for this. So anyway, we did a deal, me and Ian, we said, look, let's, we'll buy the car, me and Ian, we'll go halves on it and we'll, we'll restore it and, and keep it. You know, uh -huh. we'll keep it together or whatever. And if we ever, we had an agreement that if one of us ever wanted out, we would always sell our half to the other, the other person. <clears throat> but I noticed, and I told the interpreter to tell the farmer, would he sell this car? We agreed to buy the car, but I told him I wanted all the suspension off that car. All the proper parts. Proper parts, put him back onto this car as part of the deal, and he agreed. And I said about the engine, where's the original engine? And this farmer's going, whoa. whoa. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I'm playing detective in, I'm thinking, they've got that engine somewhere. So I said to him, you keep them talking. So I started just, you know, wandering about. I go to the back at car and there was a, like a little walkway and there was steel racking, looked under racking. There's the mount to an engine that was in this car. Really? So I said to this interpreter, I said, hey, the engine for this car is there. That engine back in that car. Anyway, the deal was agreed that they wouldn't put the engine in, but that engine would come with the car. Right. They would take the original engine out, but all the suspension would be swapped. So we shook hands. Now, it was a cash-only deal, because in Italy they get hammered for tax, apparently. Right. So he would sell it, but it had to be cash. cash. So we agreed a price, we shook on it. Can you tell us the price? <laughs> no, no it's, I don't, <laughs> it's not really, it's not really fair, but <laughs> it, it was a lot of money in the day, uh -huh. but not a lot of money in today's value. Compared to what they're worth now. Exactly. So anyway, the deal was done. We went away and we were corresponding with the interpreter, you see, that we didn't know at the time was a car dealer. That's right. what he did. And he had a lot of connections in the UK. Anyway, we came home and we were like, well, how are we going to pay cash? So we spoke on the way back, me and Ian spoke to um, the people at the airport, you know, uh, and said, look, how do we go on carrying cash? Thinking they'll say, oh, no, you can't do that. They said, oh yeah, you can carry as much cash as you want but you have to go through something to declare. Whatever you do, don't go through nothing to declare. And if they right. pick on you and find you with a load of cash, they'll lock you up. Aye. Go into something to declare, tell them that you've got X amount of pounds in cash on you, what you're buying, where you're buying it from. And as long as you've got proof 
i.e. a bank statement that shows a withdrawal of that money, absolutely fine. So as long if you don't as have a bank, out. as long as if you haven't got a bank statement, they'll go no, because it could be money laundering. No. Anyway, that everything was organised. Ian was doing the communication with the guy from Italy, and everything was fine. Then all of a sudden, he stopped. Wasn't replying to emails, phone calls, nothing. Just completely stopped communicating with us. Now we could do. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we we just assumed the guy decided not to sell it or what have you. Anyway, quite a while later, I get an excited phone call from um, Mark Donaldson. Mark is a high-end car dealer, deals in luxury cars, you know, Ferraris, race, and a lot of race cars. His son of Ian Donaldson, who owned a company called Oakfields, who was very, very well known again for dealing in high-end luxury sports cars and, and, and race cars. Mark, Ian retired and, and Mark runs his own company now. He knew this car dealer from Italy, or should I say the car dealer from Italy knew Mark. So this car dealer we didn't know had been trying to sell this car in England, knowing its value was in England, behind our backs for more money. I know Mark well and our class is a good friend, uh -huh. same as his daddy and good friends. He obviously didn't know it was me that was trying to buy it. This guy had said nothing. He'd just contacted and said, guess what we know, this car. Mark knew the value of this car. He flew out to Italy and he bought the car for more than what we'd paid for it. But Mark obviously, is, you know, he deals in all variety of cars. I'm a specialist. a specialist in these. Mark didn't understand that the bits were wrong. They'd been swapped. So Mark took the car as it was with the engine that was in it, the suspension that was in it, he bought the car, he shipped it back to the UK. Of course, he rang me straight away. Paul, you'll never guess what I've found. What, I've bought the Rob Gravett 90 car, and we were like, oh, that's where it's gone. Why, told him the story. Of course, there's no animosity between us. He, Mark didn't know it was us, we didn't know it was him, it was just a car deal, and that's it, all's fair, you know, there was no problem. So Mark set about restoring the car, because um, obviously it had been converted to left-hand drive to race out in Italy, you see. Oh, right. So it was left-hand drive when it was out there. So Mark stripped the car down, had the shell dipped, all the paint removed, got it professionally converted back to right-hand drive and, and spent a lot of money on the car, but never changed the engine of the suspension, left it as it was. And Mark's own intention was, was to sell the car anyway. So then Mark decided to put it into an auction, Silverstone Auctions. But because he's 100% honest, which he is, believe it or not, for a car dealer, he said to me, look, Paul, I don't want to sell this car under any illusion that it's 100% original and perfect. Uh -huh. I want to be honest and genuine with people about that it is the real car, but things have been changed. So he asked me if I would go down to London and meet him, and I did a report on the car to go with the car for when it was put into the auctions, with Silverstone Auctions. So everything was above board, Silverstone were aware, anybody potentially buying the car was given a copy of my report saying exactly, I won't say what was wrong with the car, it's just what had been changed. changed. Which, it's common with old race, race right. cars, as we said, they get put into different series, different, so things get changed. So I did a report saying that, you know, the suspension and the engine and that had been changed, but the parts were readily available. You could easily buy brand new, all the original parts to put the car back. So then it went to auction um, and it turned out that Zach Brown bought it. Now, Zach Brown, for those most people know he is, he's the CEO of McLaren. Did he? he? Yeah, he bought this car. So I didn't know this at the time because he didn't buy it at the auction. He'd sent somebody to buy it on his behalf because obviously Zach mainly lives in America. Uh -huh. um, he'd sent somebody to, to, um, to buy the car. And it was maybe a month or so later, I got a phone call from a guy called Paul Haig. And Paul runs the historic section of Zach's company over in Leeds. So only up road from me, United Autosport, which was a, a huge motorsport company that runs an array of different historic and modern high-end, you know, proper LM cars and whatever. I'm not into these modern cars, so forgive me if I get it wrong, but proper big stuff. But a lot of Zach's collection of cars, because he has a huge collection of famous race cars, are kept in that building. And they want, they'd seen my report, you see, uh -huh. and seen that it was wrong. So Paul had said to me, would you mind coming over, looking over the car, and basically going through what's wrong, because Zach will want this car 
hundred percent perfect. Uh -huh. Everything he has has to be perfect. So I went through with Paul and, and Nick, whose job it was to look after this car, told them what was wrong, got and cut a long story short, supplied them with all the parts, brand new to put this car back to the correct group air front uprights. Everything is, is brand new and, and correct. And then they went to Mountain Tune, who built the engine for the car originally and had a brand new and Dave Mountain said to me, a no expense spared engine, Mountain engine put back in the car, brand new management, up to date management, which we spoke about uh -huh. on other videos, how now you've got to run them on a, a modern management. So it was put back to exactly as it was. So now it is exactly as it was in period, all the original parts, a proper Mountune brand new engine in it. The shell's original, and by what I can see, other than obviously the bulkhead change for a conversion from left to right, all the original panels on it, which is rare for a race car. Was it never crashed really no, while no, it raced? Rob, Rob, never, Rob never damaged the car, crashed it or anything. And obviously we don't know what happened to it in Italy, but I've looked uh -huh. at the wings and they're all originally spot welded on, all the back quarters are spot welded on. So exactly as it was. Has it been painted? Yeah, because obviously when it went to Italy, they painted it in his livery, right. which I'll, I'll give you a picture of that. And then obviously when, when Mark restored it, he put it back into white and, and back into the original livery, which is the latest livery, because this car, the other amazing thing with this car, it was virtually an unsponsored car. When I've done my research on it, that was a lot of stuff that came up about it being virtually unsponsored. It, unbelievable, uh. really. I did make a note, and I think the first, there it is, yeah. They didn't actually get a big sponsor till round eight in 1990. Now, bearing in mind this, this is, um, the success rate earlier than that, you think people would have been throwing Jumping money on. at track start left, right and centre, right. wouldn't you? You know, the car had the shell, the little shell stickers you see on the back quarters, they uh -huh. were on. Obviously, Yokohama, because they were supplying the tyres. The tyres. And the shell on the front, the front bumper. Um, and, and that was about it. Oh, the, the Tarox, I think they were a sponsor. But it was only one or two very, very minor sponsorships. Uh -huh. and, and Rob, quite often, being interviewed at the end of a race, you know, saying, well done, and that would say, you know, we hope to be here next race. We don't know, because without a sponsor, oh, we're right. going to so struggle. Oh, right, so would it, it was incredibly tight for him in uh -huh. 1990. And I think, again, that's... <laughs> Part of the fantastic story of this car, the fact that they ran it with such an incredibly low budget, uh -huh. because even though, you know, uh, Mike Smith and Rob together were financing this, they, I think back in the day, like 35 grand a meeting. A lot of money. In them lot. days, it was colossal. Aye, money a lot to of try and spend. In 1990, it was a. And as I say, it wasn't until the eighth round where Ford Credit became a major sponsor. Was that their big main sponsor, Ford Credit? Ford Credit that you see on the doors and obviously the, the only change, obvious change when you look at early races was this was white and it just said gravit on it. Uh -huh. So they put it on the, on the screen, the doors and on the back, you know, to, was a major sponsor, the Ford Credit. And, and even, even then, I think, to be fair, he obviously helped him massively, but uh -huh. still things tight. Uh, were very, very tight. So for them to, to even compete in a full year's racing is phenomenal, really. But then to go and win it is amazing. 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 You see, we can't start the camera, it's got no fuel in it. No, it came, I only picked it up yesterday and it's got no fuel in it. Uh -huh. so, well, because obviously a lot of people, when they store these cars, they drain the fuel uh -huh. out of them. Can we have a look under the bonnet? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So there we see the famous Mamchun. Dick Johnson there. Yeah, the airbox yeah, thing there. Airbox, yeah. The Mamchun rocker cover, which they always did in red. Uh -huh. And they never skimmed, like we all see the top bit skimmed off Mamchun, never bothered. And the famous... Mountune plaque there, which everybody hopes they could afford a, a Mountune <laughs> engine. But you'll see there, even though, when it, you know, if we compared it to DJI One, that the configuration of the roll cage Aye. is absolutely identical. The only thing they didn't do on DJI One and Two, they put like a gusset plate on there, right? Where they never bothered on this. But you can see it's exactly the same the way it bolts to the bulkhead at the back. It, can we have a quick look under the bonnet? On? Yeah, to compare the two, yeah. You see there, as you pointed out, the same filter. Uh-huh. 
you can see this the cage is is exactly the same oh you pull it on there yeah the only thing they've done and on that car which, added. to be honest i don't think them because it's had a lot of strength really no. anyway to be fair the only thing they did do on that car which was probably again out of experience of working on it the stuck brace they lifted it slightly oh right. give you a bit more clearance which was a but you know everything when you look all oh, the, I don't look at the um the bot the tank at the back for the brake fluid uh -huh. all the breather tanks identical amazing and as i say it's very you might not see because it's dark in there but you, you know you can see the battery box in the back look the lids off man but the battery box is exactly the same then the single crossbar on the, on the cage other, and th other than that the cage is, is is copied exactly but yeah you can see can't you the, uh, the, the you know the mirrors what exactly. you were mentioning how i think pulled up they just had the brand new shell you see parked in the workshop uh -huh. and they just had a the 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 one and two were parked there and the, the fabricators they just ran uh, right and right made, uh, measurements and you know well, why reinvent the wheel exactly because exactly. rob, rob had good success with this car in 89 so i said they've just thought well it works so let's just build a brand new uh -huh. car Copy just it. To, what a collection are you I'm very lucky aren't and, yeah aren't you just Obviously they're not all mine, this is Kerry's from Australia that we've featured before. My new car that we built to race, hopefully this year, dependent on what happens with this Covid, COVID. Thing, I hope to race that this year. And then obviously my uh, Bastos. Egg we'll have there. to do a video on this Paul. Yeah, but yeah when it comes to the British cars though, this is the one. This is the one. And it's come here to be sold. The owner of the car, because uh, Zach Brown actually sold the car, um, he um, got rid of a few of his collection. He sold this car because he didn't use it. He intended on racing it, I believe. And I didn't believe, racing this, did he? Yeah, because they did a bit of testing with it. Um, and Zach, I don't think he was that keen on it, really. I think Zach likes his low air road cars, uh, you know. Like a McLaren. He, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he was going to race at Silverstone Classic and share the drive with Rob Gravett. Oh, all right. I think that was the plan. But anyway, he sold it and he sold it to a, um, a guy fairly local to, to me here. He was going to race it, he was going to use it, but that, things have changed, I think, for him in his personal life and he's decided to let it go So, if he gets the right offer for it. So it's come here. I picked you up yesterday, as I say, to advertise it and, uh -huh. and see if we can sell the car. But Rob, I know, and Bradley, his son, would love to drive it again so there's an opportunity there for anybody if they wanted to buy the car and wanted to race it that they could race it again with with rob with rob, rob, with rob driving and bradley's son if they wanted to because bradley's son says is racing now in a mini series and i know bradley's keen to see this car he's obviously grown up knowing about this car Aye. and his dad's success with it so I think he's going to come up and have a look at the car. If yeah. anyone's interested in the car, Paul, should I, should I just leave your details below? And then yeah, if you can, me yeah, and I'll even give you my phone number if somebody's serious about it. I mean, it's um, it's not going to be a cheap car, but no. I can assume people will understand the history of this car, the fact that it is on the button, ready to race. Everything's been refurbished, brand new engine, everything, gearbox diff have been rebuilt. Um, it's got, look at that for a history file. <laughs> uh, you, don't, you don't see history files like that on road cars, no. do you? But there's, you know, even the, the certificate for the brand new fuel tank. Um, there's all there, the FIA papers. So Let's we, get that book for a pile. We'll give it a little. You like to show inside the books, will it? Yeah, yeah, the FIA papers is what, um, what you get to, pr to prove the car is either an original car or it's been built to exact specifications it tells you there how everything should be what parts have to be used to make it comply um you know it's quite a it, it's detailed. quite a detailed thing to get that looks the, like a good read that mine uh, it is it's fabulous but to get a car you know to through its um inspection it's quite detailed you know the car has to be absolutely 100 percent exactly correct to the original FIA book mm -hmm. and all them photographs you saw there briefly they are all captions from the original FIA papers so they even go into great detail of the inside the turbocharger everything that's how detailed they go to that these cars have to be built to showing you there which prop shafts you can use oh, what right. top mounts you can use they're the rally car uprights but you know it's quite quite very detailed it is 
and as I say, it has to be exactly right, or you uh -huh. won't get the paper. So it's got it's got them, which is nice. Um, operating condition um, conditions for the engine, so it's all what mount will give you to look after it, and then just letters and look at that for snippets from uh -huh. the car's history. There's there's the car looking the Italian livery, and that's the original logbook. Because you know these race cars do have a logbook uh -huh. that you stamp. They're the Italian logbooks. What the hell? Look, look at that for snippets from. Is that just out of newspapers All and magazines of newspapers, and magazines and that telling you the success and look how many there is. Aye. A lot of invoices there. I won't put people's Aye. personal thing on, but a lot of invoices for the car. There that shows you the car look being stripped um, to a bare shell and, and dipped. That's as that's the car in Italy look where we found it. Aye. There's the original engine. The history on it. Like, there it yeah, is. Yeah, right there. There it is. Look, racing in Italy. Aye. Right. Right. Look, flame out the side. Yeah, you can see it there. <laughs> there, there it is as a left-hand driving side. Aye. Well, there's the cars look, and there's how we found them. Is that how you found them? Is that's that inside how we the, found them. The look the at all the racks at the back. I'll land to you there next to it in the bottom yeah. corner. No, oh, I had some uh, pretty amazing cars, but. You know, an incredible history. Hard Rob there when he was Aye. a bit younger. Yeah, if anybody's, Aye, if anybody's uh, interested in it, they can just get view of the car and, and see what they think. Hi right, fellas, cheers for watching. If you're interested in the car, it is for sale, like Paul mentioned. I'll leave Paul's contact information below. Paul's, you've also got a couple of Facebook pages, Paul, haven't you? Yeah, it's probably best if anybody's genuinely seriously interested, they can message me or whatever through um, through Facebook Messenger. I've got um, my own page, which is Paul in Foot Racing, or there's also the RS500 owners page. So there's two methods there you can catch me, uh, you know, on, on either of them. There will be some adverts placed on them two um, pages shortly anyway. For the car. the car, which will detail the descriptions and and everything about it. So, Alright, yeah. cool. Thanks for watching fellas. I'll catch you on the next one. Spot Cheers. on Paul. Spot Thanks. on mate.